This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. This week, I'm speaking to Michael Perry, aka Mr. Plant Geek, whose new book, Hort is Curious, takes a look at the lesser known side of the plant world. If you follow Michael on social media, you'll know he's always off somewhere exciting to meet unusual plants, and his book profiles some of the most bizarre, interesting and occasionally terrifying plants the natural world has to offer. We talk about rare plants, useful plants, conniving plants, beautiful plants and plants you can only encounter safely from behind glass. But first, I found out where it all started. I guess when I was a kid, it was, yeah, the typical kind of Venus flytrap, this and that, but then really quite standard plants. And obviously, through my career, I kind of worked on lots of new plants, but kind of more balcony, kind of bedding, kind of uh, new perennials, etc. So, yeah, indeed, putting together the Tom Tato, the egg and chips plant, which is aubergines on the top, potatoes on the bottom. Yeah, I guess that started to give me the real taste for the unusual. I think then starting to get a few friends at different botanic gardens, getting behind the scenes, kind of learning a bit more about those as well. And I'm not a botanist. You know, in some ways, I'm barely a horticulturalist. I'm really kind of like a guy that loves plants and kind of got into marketing over the years. So really, I had to go back to basics and learn the botany in order to then translate it to my audience in a way that is hopefully easily digestible and, and a little bit fun as well. Yeah, it definitely is. So you've got a book out, it's called Hortus Curious. And I wondered if you could give people just an overview of the types of plants that you cover in the book. So there's five different chapters, and those chapters kind of range through from the greater good, which is a chapter all about the plants that we know in our day-to-day lives, but we don't know that we know them. So coffee plants, pineapple plants, you know, a lot of people out there won't know how a pineapple grows, for example. So this was a great way to kind of bring that back to real basics, stuff that you see as you look around you, cotton as well, you know, plants like this. There's also the superheroes. So these are plants like the miracle berry that can change sour flavors to sweetness. You've also got the largest flower in the world. You've got the smallest flowering plant in the world. You've got the X-rated section, which isn't edited or kind of censored at all. These are plants that look a bit cheeky for a number of different reasons. Then you've got the mistaken identity. These are plants that look like other types of plants. And sometimes they look like insects. Sometimes they look like ducks not trying to look like a duck, but trying to look like a sawfly. So there's a lot of really, really cool stories behind those as well. So yeah, five really fun chapters. So you've also got plants behaving badly. So that rounds off the set there. They are all really, really interesting sections and they've got some amazing plants in them. And I thought it might be good to talk about some of the features of some of the plants that are in the book. So I thought I would start by asking you about the hairs on a gimpy gimpy plant. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. This is often called the world's most dangerous plant because it inflicts a pain that can last for months, if not years. They also quite tragically call it the suicide plant because many people cannot bear the pain because it kind of injects these almost like hypodermic needles with these stinging neurotoxin hairs and they like break off at the tip. So it suddenly makes lily pollen seem really kind of harmless because they often say remove it with wax strips or sellotape. That is the only way to really get them out the moment that they go into your skin. So it's a plant that is native to the Daintree rainforest in Australia. And it really is to be feared because it grows in all different forms. So it could be as an ankle biter, as a low shrub. It could be a bigger tree. Sometimes the hairs actually hang in the air. So face masks are a must in the areas where this gimpy gimpy tree grows. I actually met it once behind glass in a botanical garden in Holland. Safe distance. Yeah, it's absolutely terrifying. So obviously that grows in Australia, I'm guessing in slightly out of the way areas. There's a lot of plants in your book that are quite rare or quite unusual. Which of the plants Mm -hmm. that you write about are you kind of most likely to encounter in real life? There's some that are kind of quite day to day almost. So you've got a uh, Dictamnus albus, which is the burning bush. You might often see this in a perennial mix border, growing alongside lupins or delphiniums. This is up about 100 different chemicals, and it actually can catch fire to itself. Now, a lot of the research hasn't decided why it does that. It could be to start bushfires intentionally. It could be just as a kind of byproduct of all of those chemicals. So that is a plant that you can easily grow in borders in the UK. A few more obvious ones would be the Venus flytrap which is notable not just for eating flies, 
but also for being able to count as well. It can count to 20 because those little hairs inside the pads need to be triggered twice in 20 seconds before the pad even thinks about closing. So you've got those two that seem kind of quite day to day, quite common. They could easily just be in the middle of your garden somewhere or what else would be a good example? So maybe lithops, the living stones. These are ones that we grow as kids. Really lovely succulent to grow as a plant, but also from seed, which is really rewarding. And they've got a great history to them. They're still being discovered to this very day because they're so camouflage. And also you're talking about that kind of solar panel on the top, the way they let light in. There's fascinating plants you can grow simply on your windowsill. You know, it's not always about trekking off to the Amazon or Borneo or some far reaches. So there are quite a few, actually, that you could find in your own garden or you could grow, I guess, as house plants. Absolutely. Do you grow any of them yourself? I'm busy traveling so much at the minute. Whenever I try and grow a plant, I can't keep it alive very well because, of course, most of these are a little bit exotic. And the one plant that has really evaded me for the last like six months is the dancing plant. So you'll see this in the plants behaving badly section, I think. And this is actually a plant that can move itself. So this is Codiorocalyx motorius. And in theory, it's a plant that we could grow a seed on the windowsill and you can start to see that movement because it actually moves in relation to vibrations and sound. And it's relatively easy to germinate, but needs a lot of humidity once it starts growing. And of course, I wasn't really giving it the right attention that it needed. So yeah, that is one that I really regret not being able to grow. But of course, there's really cool plants all around us. You know, here where I'm just looking at some Boston ferns in my lounge and some Monstera, you know, there's great stories inside most of the plants that we grow. I'm definitely ready for Hortus Curious too. Let me tell you that. Yeah, I bet. A lot of the plants that you've already mentioned show a degree of self-awareness and almost sentience. What are your thoughts on plant intelligence? Oh, absolutely. These plants, like, they do everything that they need to do. They trap predators. They kind of fool predators. They do all of this without even moving sometimes. You know, plants are absolutely amazing. The layers of kind of intelligence are there in the evolution as well. And one great example, I'm just looking at it on the back cover here, is the Calcellaria uniflora, which has been chosen for the book because it looks fun. It looks like a little alien. But it's not trying to look like an alien. It's actually this size and shape because that little white lip actually tastes of marzipan. So a lovely almond flavor. And the distance between that white lip and the pollinating parts of the flower is the same distance as between a seed snipe bird's beak and the top of its head. And so it actually goes to eat this little piece of tasty marzipan and gets the pollen all over its head. And then it goes to eat the next flower and then pollinates the bloom. So this plant has kind of learned this and evolved this over thousands, millions of years. And that just astounds me, the way that animals work with the plants as well. And it could be they're working together or they're working in competition, or it could be the Caliana major, the flying duck orchid, which is actually trying to catfish the pollinating male sawflies that try to pseudo copulate with the flower. So there's so many ways that plants are fun, manipulative, deceitful. They get what they want at the end of the day every time. <laughs> so speaking of which, obviously we've spoken about the gimpy gimpy, but some plants may have deadly intentions. What is the deadliest plant that you write about? Oh, deadliest. Uh, pro probably the gimpy gimpy is the deadliest because this is not necessarily a poison. It's almost seen as more kind of dangerous because it gives you that long standing kind of inflicting pain in there as well. But aside from that, we haven't got too many poisonous plants. The sandbox tree. So that is uh, Hevia brasiliensis. And that is often called the noisiest plant because actually it ricochets the seeds as they kind of snap open. They ricochet from tree to tree and create a lot of noise in the rainforest. But that is actually one that has got toxins in as well. So there's kind of dangerous plants everywhere you look, even in our everyday gardens as well. And it's just about kind of taking care and maybe not picking the wrong fungus as well, because there's a few few dangerous fungus in the book too when you look through. Um, what would you say, in your opinion, I know this is completely subjective, but what do you feel was the most attractive plant that you wrote about? I don't know, because everything's different. Like, I'm just flicking through now and I'm thinking, oh, even a peanut plant looks attractive. But I think part of this is actually the way the book has been illustrated, because 
this book would be nothing without the illustrator. So Aaron Apsley, a guy that's based in Florida, he drew a lot of the plants from his own specimens in his garden, quite a tropical garden there, but also a lot of his photography from travels as well. So I often see the book as being really, we wrote it together. You know, he's done amazing photorealistic illustrations and I've put together kind of fun words, but they wouldn't mean much without these gorgeous photos. See, because now I'm looking here and I'm seeing the, the gorgeous Angaloa, which is the tulip orchid, which is like that little rocking baby orchid as well. So, yeah, it would be hard to choose on that. Sorry, Sarah. He, yeah, he <laughs> has done amazing illustrations, actually. And I guess the kind of rarity of the plants means that it would be difficult, I guess, to source pictures of everything in there. So the illustrations really do bring it to life. And thinking about kind of rare plants, what would be the rarest one that you've written about? The rarest? Mm. Well, lots of things are rare on different levels. I guess probably the one with the most tumultuous story would be the Wallamy pine. Because as a lot of us know, this was kind of grown about 40 million years ago and then was kind of lost for years and years and years until about 1994. And they actually stumbled across this kind of grove of trees just in the Sydney area in Australia. And they realized this was the great forgotten Wallamy pine. I remember in the kind of 90s when it was introduced into the UK as a commercial tree. And it was a fascinating story because it was actually released into commercial distribution because they wanted to preserve the tree. Because the best way then was to get it into more hands, into more gardens, kind of get it planted here and there in order to secure this tree's future. But there are a couple of twists and turns because it nearly died. The original grove nearly died kind of later in the 2000s when there was uh, some mildew that nearly affected the whole crop of the plants. And then again, the bushfires in Sydney a few years ago are then at risk again. So this is a tree that has really overcome the odds. And so whilst that might not be the most rare, it's certainly the one that has had the most dramatic journey so far over millions of years. There were so many eye-opening stories in the book, actually, and so many interesting quirks and interspecies relationships, which you've touched on. One particularly sparked my interest, and that was the ants that live on the Bullhorn Acacia. Can you talk a little bit about them? Yes, there's lots of different kind of ways that the ants and the tree kind of look after each other, really. So the tree actually has these big fawns on it. So it's Acacia cornigera. And the big fawns actually create a home for the ants because they burrow a little hole inside and they live inside. Well, not quite rent free because the ants are actually relied on to ward off predators to the tree. So not only are those spines kind of a little bit off putting, but actually when a predator comes nearby, the ants kind of swarm and they like scare off the predator. And they're known to kind of almost like swarm on the goat's head you know, kind of like telling it to go away. And, and the ants also nip off the heads of little germinating seedlings around this tree as well. So it really protects them. But the tree kind of thanks the ants in a couple more ways as well, because there's little Beltian bodies, so little kind of food sacks that also appear along the stem of the tree as well. So it's really, really cool. But the tree also keeps the ants in control because in this kind of feed that it gives them is kind of like this addictive kind of almost like nicotine kind of in it so is this tree is manipulating those ants to do exactly what it needs to do it's really there's a lot of corruption in the plant world let me tell you <laughs> in thinking about plants that are useful to things and people you've obviously mm. you've got your chapter on productive plants that are useful and i was thinking about if you lived in the uk for example are there any that you could grow and would be likely to get a crop from yeah, let's have a little flick, actually. So first up, we've got tea plants. Now, you can grow tea in the UK. It's a camellia, so it's perfectly hardy. Most people don't really believe or know that tea is a camellia, but it is camellia sinensis. You can grow that and create a nice crop in the UK. So obviously a little bit cooler conditions. You're going to be able to wilt those and roll them and bake them and make your own fresh green tea at home. Needs an acid soil, similar to a few camellias out there as well. Cotton, a little bit more difficult, so we'll skip over that one. Chocolate tree, not at all. Coffee, we can have coffee as a house plant. Unlikely to get it to bean, although I know there's a nice crop at the Eden Project. Pineapple plants, not so possible, but can be done. Obviously, the pygmy pineapple we see quite often. It's edible, but quite bitter. And then we've got peanut plants in here. Now, I know they grow lovely crops of those at Hyde Hall, so that is possible. And really fascinating for kids how it kind of burrows itself underground to produce those nuts. 
And then we've got a rubber tree and cashew, which are no-nos. So yeah, you've got probably 50% of those you can have a crack at. Yeah, I've grown peanuts and I was amazed. They did actually produce nuts under the ground. I was gobsmacked. They're so clever. Really? Good crop? Yeah. Yeah, No, not a good crop, but a crop. You know, it it was something. Yeah. Like growing chickpeas. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. (laughs) I would like to know how you managed to get past your publisher saying that a cashew nut cream's in your mouth. Oh, do you know there's worse things in there than that? (laughs) (laughs) I was so naive. I didn't spot them. I have to say, though, DK, it was a dream to work with them, first of all, because these are the books that I poured over when I was a kid. A lovely diagram set onto white backgrounds, learned so much from DK books. But then to work with them and have their guidance to obviously have this lovely bright pink cover, the gorgeous illustrations and the layout. But they gave me pretty much complete author freedom. And I know that when Jane Perrone, she reviewed the book and she said, Mm, my grammatical kind of witches were on alert when I saw a sentence starting with OK. And that was kind of like a really good indication that they really let me write it in the conversational style that I kind of wanted to. And it, the book is like I'm kind of almost reading it to you as well. And it's really kind of built as a book that you would just pick up and just read a chapter. There's no pressure. You don't have to know anything about plants before you pick it up. In fact, it's kind of designed for anyone that loves plants, but also people that think that they don't even like plants because they pick it up and they're like, what? That's pretty cool. The plant does that. And it's written in a way that is not kind of smug. It doesn't assume that you understand anything, but at the same time, it doesn't patronize you if you do already understand something. So I'm quite pleased with the balance. And uh, DK really supported me in getting that out there. It's very nice. And it's written really authentically. It's not trying too hard to be your friend. It is just like you say, listening to you talking. It's it's really well done. I think you've had a line of clothing and you've had Rubus Cockburnianus on one of your tops and you didn't put it in the book and I was gutted. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We've got the X-rated section and I've obviously had the Rude Botany t-shirt range in the past, but Rubus Cockburnianus, I really wanted it in there for the Rude name. But there's probably, we couldn't pull together four pages telling the story of this magnificent silver stem shrub. There's not that much story about it. So it kind of didn't stretch. So <laughs> Didn't make the cut. Fair enough. Obviously, you've mentioned about a second book, which I do hope you will be writing. Is there scope for more to be discovered? Are there more plants out there that are really surprising to people? Definitely. I mean... I've already joked and bugged DK and said, well, uh, series two, we should start on it soon. But if it happens, it happens. It would be really cool if it did. But the reason the book was instinctive is that I've been doing the Weird and Wacky Plant Show for quite a few years across the UK and worldwide as well. And as I'd gone along, I was building a spreadsheet of these plants to talk about in the presentations. And and I've got those almost categorized. The book was quite easy to pull together. And there's way enough for a series two without even doing much research. So yeah, it's, it's ready to go. I should start it this winter. Also, I was thinking, you know, you're very well travelled and you have access to a lot of plants in the development stage and lots of really cool nurseries. If somebody was thinking about starting a journey on their own of looking into unusual plants or, you know, really quirky plants, how could they go about that? The best place to start your journey looking at unusual plants is really, and I know it sounds a bit cheesy, but it's really Instagram. Because when I was young, I was obviously a geek. I was interested in plants. It was kind of quite hard to reach out to like-minded people. And of course, I had some great books. Obviously, there's great books that are out these days. But really, for that real-time connection and kind of chatting with people about the plants and getting to know the people that really know the plants as well and kind of that real-time connection, you can't beat the internet. And I know there's a lot of bad sides to social media, but for horticulture, It's really connected us and it's made the whole horticultural world feel so much less lonely and also more connected and more knowledge to be shared as well. So I think to start learning about unusual plants, your first port of call is just a kind of healthy scroll on Instagram, I would say. It's a good place to start. And obviously, aside from your Mr. Plant Geek account, are there any that you would recommend? Oh, gosh, that's a really big question. Um, I would say, first of all, I would direct you to some of the people that supported my book. So I'm not a botanist by any stretch, as I mentioned. So I really relied on my botanist friends all around the world to help me bounce off them. And so I could understand the botany and then translate it. So I would say Alistair Robinson, who's based in uh, Australia. 
Melbourne Botanic Garden. Also, Mark Hatchadorian, who's based at New York Botanic Garden as well. They were great helpers with my book and really great to look out for on Instagram as well. But of course, aside from all of the great houseplant experts out there, there's kind of more exotic lines, but also move towards the outdoor plants. There's some great experts there too. So yeah, it's really getting into Instagram and just kind of delving. Maybe there's a certain plant you're interested in and you could then search that hashtag and then you you never know where you're going to turn out and who you're going to meet as well. It's been amazing for horticulture, I have to say. Thank you very much to Michael and thanks to you for listening. Here's Dr Ian Bedford now talking about a bug that some next door neighbours might actually celebrate. Despite their reputation for causing the occasional problem between neighbours, Lilandi conifers can actually be quite beneficial within a garden when they're maintained as a compact and long-lasting evergreen hedge. Tolerating a wide range of soil types, a Lilandi hedge can provide a robust natural barrier that not only shields and protects gardens from prevailing winds and harsh winter weather, but research has recently shown that it'll filter out pollution from air 40% more effectively than a native hawthorn hedge. In addition, its inner structure offers the ideal habitat for many native birds to nest in and provides shelter for other garden wildlife to rest within or hibernate under during the winter. And in my garden, a Lelandi hedge plays an important role in helping sustain the insect life, providing a nocturnal hideaway to many, such as the peacock butterflies that after their daily sessions on the buddleias, retreat to the hedge, flashing the eye spots on their wings to deter potential predators before squeezing their way inside. This hedge also supports native ivy that grows up the trunks to form a leafy canopy on top, hosting caterpillars of the holly blue butterflies, which then overwinter as pupae until the following spring. For Lilandi to fit within a wildlife friendly garden though, they will have to be managed since they're the fastest growing conifer that we have in Britain. But realistically, this should only involve one or two trims each year to retain an appropriate size. Other than that, Lilandi require only minimal care and are not prone to many pests and diseases. However, there is one that's increasingly become more of a problem since it appeared in Britain during the 1980s. And that's the Cypress aphid an invasive species from North America that first came here on imported trees. This dark coloured aphid specifically feeds on conifers, sucking out sap from May to November and causing most damage during the height of summer when the foliage on infested trees begins to dry and turn brown. The aphid's colour matches the bark, which makes them quite difficult to see within a hedge, even when infestations are large. But if left untreated, they'll continue to spread, and over time the hedge will become increasingly more patchy and might eventually die. So regular inspection is essential if cypress aphids are to be found early enough to be controlled. Then by carefully pruning out the most infested areas, and thoroughly and repeatedly drenching the surrounding leaves, stems and trunks with a soap-based product, a Lelandi hedge and the beneficial wildlife that live within it can hopefully be saved. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.